So, 안녕하세요, 여러분. Hello, everyone. 저는 Beck Sungi입니다. My name is Alma Sungi Beck. I use she, her pronouns in English, and we don't have gendered pronouns in Korean. I am one of the climate justice co-chairs for the Climate Reality Project Bay Area Chapter, and I will be the moderator today of our program, People Over Pipelines, Line 3, Climate Justice and Allyship for Indigenous Rights. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your interest in our program today, August 2021 chapter event brought to you by our Climate Justice Team's Indigenous Voices Project. So first of all, um, a brief tech announcement. Please mute yourself when, um, when you're not talking. And we are gonna have a question and answer period at the end. And the person who will be asking those questions is me, the moderator. So if you have a question you'd like the speakers to answer, please chat me directly. So you should be able to find me in the chat and just private chat me to Alba. So now for our acknowledgement of the land and the indigenous peoples of this land that we occupy in the San Francisco Bay Area. The native peoples of the Bay Area have served as stewards of this land and its living creatures, including humans for millennia and continue to lead and model much of what we need to know and do to solve the current climate crisis. And so with respect, I wish to acknowledge the Yalamu or Ramatush Ohlone of San Francisco, the Ohlone bands of Chichenyo and Karin of the East Bay, the Yokuts, Mwekma, Coastal Miwok, Southern Pomo, Kashaya, Potwin, Michelle Walwapo, and the Bay Miwok. We do this land acknowledgement to remind ourselves of the oppression of indigenous people, especially here on this land, and how the taking and exploiting of indigenous lands and people is directly connected to the climate crisis that we face now. It is also a reminder to follow the leadership of indigenous people here and everywhere as we seek and build long-term solutions to our global climate crisis. Um, our first speaker is Sarah Diefendorf, who is Director of Environmental Finance Center West at Earth Island Institute. She specializes in building financial communications and leadership capacity in the US and abroad. Um, Sarah has worked with Native American tribes throughout the American Southwest, including California for over 15 years to help build green economies through strengthening tribal codes and regulations and supporting strategic solid waste and recycling climate vulnerability and adaptation, and water protection planning. Sarah has served as a national and international capacity builder um, and leadership trainer for the League of Women Voters, the Center for Collaborative Exchange, and in countries around the world, including South Africa, Zimbabwe, Ethiopia, Democratic Republic of Congo, Nigeria, Jamaica, Armenia, Uganda, Kenya, and Thailand. She is also my friend and a member of the Climate Reality Project Bay Area Chapter, where she serves with me and others on our Indigenous Voices Planning team. Welcome, Sarah. Um, second, we have Elaine McCarty. Elaine works with Sarah at the Environmental Finance Center West as Associate Director. She helps tribes, organizations, and communities build capacity through training, education, and technical assistance on environmental issues such as climate change, water, and waste. She is also co-director of the Women's Climate Centers International, which strives to catalyze resilience in vulnerable communities in East Africa and is currently building its first women-led center in Uganda. Elaine is a member of USCAN, the United States Climate Action Network, and Arm in Arm, both of which will be discussed today in the program. And she serves on the steering committee for the Climate Emergency Mobilization Task Force and is chair of the legislative committee. Welcome, Elaine. Um, third, we have Carrie Clayton, Senior Director of US CAN, the US Climate Action Network. Carrie joined US CAN in 2013, where her work focuses on building trust and alignments among US CAN members. She believes strongly that to address the climate crisis, we must embrace people of all backgrounds and seek to foster a culture where everyone is welcome and historically, structurally oppressed voices are heard. A resident of Sandpoint, Idaho, Carrie sits on two local nonprofit boards, the Bonner County Human Rights Task Force and 350sandpoint.org. Welcome, Carrie. And last but not least, Sydney Mosier is the network coordinator at US CAN and works with Carrie and has been with the network in various roles since 2017. Uh, with the exception of a short break to study for her LSAT in pursuit of becoming an environmental justice attorney. 
She works to support both the systems and engagement teams. She graduated from UC Berkeley in 2016 with a degree in physical geography where she discovered her passion for environmental justice, food justice, and fighting climate change. Welcome Sydney and Sarah, take it away. Okay, thank you, Alma. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And hopefully everyone is hearing me well. And get on to Keynote. Okay, so I'm just gonna bury a few things here so that I don't have to see my floating panel. And I'm gonna make sure that, okay, here we go. All righty. So welcome everybody. Um, obviously this is a presentation about uh, the line three action, but um, we want to take you down a little bit of a history path, a treaty path, and so on, and um, give you some background as to how we got to where we are. So my job is to start with a little history, because um, the history of Indigenous peoples in this country is a, a huge roller coaster, mostly of downs and a few ups. And this is just a little taste of it. There are so many court cases, so many decisions, so many policies that I'm not going to even touch. But Starting from pre-discovery, um, if we, we would put discovery in quotes, obviously, we start to go down the roller coaster to 1493 and the doctrine of discovery, the first settlement in Jamestown. We go a little up into the Marshall Trilogy where there are some, some wins for tribes, but then we go very deeply down into the, the era of Indian appropriation and allotment. We move up into the Merriam Report, which was not great, but it helped move towards reorganization. But then we flew back down to the very bottom with the termination policies, moved back up again into self-determination, religious freedom policies, gaming act, and of course, down again to a report that I'm gonna talk a little bit called the Quiet Crisis and a final decision called the Cheryl versus Oneida uh, Supreme Court decision. So we're just gonna go over those a little bit quickly. This is a little history. Starting with the doctrine of discovery. Why do I start here? This is 1493, a papal bull which basically said any land not inhabited by Christians was available to be discovered, claimed, and exploited by Christian rulers. So this is the established papal bull, essentially, which would lead to established law that gave colonists, colonizers, the right to basically colonize and take land from people that they didn't really see as people or as humans. This led eventually, and it was quite some time, to the Marshall Trilogy. So we're kind of skipping over the arrival, the discovery, the Jamestown, and what are known as the Indian Wars, to the Marshall Trilogy, which was one of the largest Supreme Court decisions about the viability and the reality of tribal life in this country up until that point. There were a series of three different decisions between 1823 and 1832, and essentially Chief Justice John Marshall and his court confirmed the doctrine of discovery. If we remember, that's where Christians only have the right to claim land, and they basically stated that the principle of discovery gave European nations an absolute right to new world lands. So you have the Supreme Court confirming a papal bull that it is their right to have taken land from the indigenous peoples of this country. At the same time, they established the native peoples and their tribal lands as domestic dependent nations. In other words, your land is our land, but you're still an independent um, but dependent. And then they also confirmed the independence and sovereignty of the tribes at that time in which they established it was a government, a tribal government to the federal government relationship. States didn't really have a say. Unfortunately, things kept moving forward through Indian wars and Indian appropriation and so on. And they do use that term in government. So I use it as well. Um, to the Indian Appropriation Act of 1871. This is the big downward slew that we see in the, the uh, roller coaster. And basically this determined that, well, you were independent when we thought you were a threat, but now that it's 1871, tribes were no longer defined necessarily as independent nations. Their members became wards of the state. This is the founding of the trust status that you may have heard of with tribes. And you can ask us about that later if you're unsure about what that means. 
and it became the end of the treaty era. So if you were a tribe and you have not created a treaty with the United States by this time, you're not gonna get one either, which is why Alaska actually, Alaskan tribes have no treaties and they're actually treated differently than any tribes in the United States. The same thing with Hawaiian tribes, they are not tribes, right? Uh, but at this time, no treaties were ever invalidated. We move further down the slope of the roller coaster to 1887 to 1928, when you had the General Allotment Act, which basically started to carve up reservations. So at this point, they have moved tribes onto reservations, but they decided tribes had far too much land. So between this period, which was an attempt to, to truly assimilate tribes, they dropped from 138 million acres of land to 48 million acres of land. And reservations were divided up so that tribal members were able to get a tribal family, I believe, got 160 acres and each, each individual member got 80 acres to do as they see fit for 25 years, at which point the land would become what's called fee simple. In other words, they outright owned it. The rest of the land that tribal members didn't get were sold. So as you can see, find lands in the West, go out, move on. This was the land rush that you see, they were taking tribal lands. So in 1928, the Miriam Report was, was written to look at the status of tribes at the time. And a quote from it says, it almost seems as if the government assumed that some magic and in individual ownership of property would in itself prove an educational civilizing factor. But unfortunately, this policy has for the most part operated in the opposite direction, creating poverty, disease, death, and especially child abuse through all of the Indian schools located throughout the United States. So as you can see, the roller coaster ebbs and flows. In this case, you had a government that was more favorable for tribes. The Merriam Report came out and it directly led to what was called the Indian Reorganization Act between 1928 and 1942. In that period of time, if, we, if you remember the allotment period, any unused allotments or unsold allotments were essentially returned back to the tribe. So the reservations became bigger, although many are still checkerboarded today. So you'll see a black square is owned by a tribe, a white square is owned by a non-tribal person, right? So they're checkerboarded. Trust status was extended to allotments indefinitely. In other words, they were no longer going to turn over to fee simple. That's important because fee simple means the land you own, but it also means you get taxed. So in this case, the allotments stayed away from that and they know we're not going to be taxed for the land um, once it turned over to them. The allotment policy ended and actually some new reservations were established. Unfortunately, this was just a small uprise in the roller coaster. And between 1943 and 1968, you got the termination policies. And this was essentially Congress tired of dealing with tribes, tired of dealing with the whole situation and wanted to end the government to government relationship with Native Americans. They wanted to terminate the trust relationship in which land is held in trust by the federal government for tribes. They wanted to relocate members of tribes to the cities and tried to entice them with all sorts of advantages if they decided to move. Um, California, Minnesota, and a few other states were given civil and criminal jurisdiction over tribes, which had never been the case before. It was always a government to federal government relationship, and more than 100 tribes were terminated between this time period, many of them in California. Finally, you had an upswing again. So in 1975, when you had the civil rights movement and the American Indian movement, you ended up with the Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistance Act, which finally gave rights back to tribal members and tribes were now able to exercise some of their sovereignty. They were able to run their schools, their health centers, their environmental protection and policing. However, they, is, they all had limits on them. So for instance, a tribe can police up to a uh, only crimes committed by tribal members. If a white person comes on and say, as it does happen, rapes a woman on a reservation, that white person cannot be prosecuted by the tribe. And then that was followed by the American Religious Freedom Act, arguably one of the most important um, pieces of legislation of rights given back to tribes. So this was the first time, 1978, when Native American tribes were allowed in the United States to practice their own religions. What's important though, is they also have the freedom and the right to their sacred spaces, many of which pipelines cross. 
So this legalizes traditional spirituality and ceremonies and supports the right to visit sacred sites, use of religious sacraments, and performing services in a traditional manner. And this plays out in line three. In 1988, the very top of the roller coaster, this may not seem like a great moment to a lot of people who particularly don't like casinos, but the Indian Gaming Act of 1988 allowed for a commercial opportunity for tribes to actually be able to finally make some wealth, to be able to pour that money back into clinics and into schools and into housing. And so it was actually an incredibly powerful act that enabled tribes to start to reclaim their power in a way that America understands, which is through the building of wealth. Unfortunately, this report came out in 2003 and it shows that there is a legacy. It found that American Indian youths are twice as likely to commit suicide. Native Americans are 630% more likely to die from alcoholism, 650% more likely to die from tuberculosis, and 318% more likely to die from diabetes. This is not 19th century history, nor 18th century. Native American communities still suffer the effects of historical trauma from broken treaties and other forms of oppression, such as efforts to eliminate their languages, cultures, and religions. And then we can go back to the beginning. Remember that doctrine of discovery, that thing that was almost 600 years ago? In 2005, in the city of Sherrill, New York versus the Oneida Indian Nation of New York, the Supreme Court determined that under the doctrine of discovery, fee title ownership to the lands occupied by Indians when the colonists arrived became vested in the sovereign, first the discovering European nation and later the original states in the United States. In other words, the Oneida tried to buy back their own land from the city of Sherrill and they didn't wanna be taxed. They wanted to enroll it into their own sovereign space. But the Supreme Court determined that under the doctrine of discovery, they didn't have that right because the land had been turned over to the sovereign at the time, the United States, and then the states under the doctrine of discovery, 2005, almost 600 years later. So that's just a quick history. Now we're gonna go sort of back in time and forward in time a little bit to honoring the treaties. And I hand it over to Elaine. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Thanks for your patience while we um, transfer here. Okay, so yeah, I'm picking up with the uh, treaties. And uh, so in order to understand the tribal disputes with line three pipelines, we need some background and context on the treaties specific to what we now call Minnesota. And the bulk of what is now Minnesota was signed over to the US government in a dozen treaties over about three decades. So a relatively short period of time uh, in the mid 1800s when tribes ceded the land in exchange for payments, rights and permanent reservations. I'm gonna focus on three treaties that I uh, most consider the most significant implications for um, for treaty rights and, um, and particularly for the line three disputes. Here we go. So to start with the 1837 treaty. So in this treaty, um, tribes were explicitly afforded, uh, well, I'm having a trouble here. There we go. Okay, so the 1837 treaty, was primarily focused on timber because the business interests and the US government was looking at the beautiful lands in Minnesota and the forests as a means to expand and they needed um, timber in order to build. So the 1837 treaty was particularly focused on acquiring lands for timber. It did, and very importantly, establish fishing, hunting and harvesting rights on the ceded lands. It was very specifically said that the tribes, when they ceded their lands, held on to those rights. However, um, partly through some of the uh, rulings and laws that Sarah talked about, uh, in the case of Minnesota, the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources asserted Minnesota law and basically obstructed the tribal people from um, 
from fulfilling their rights to harvest and fish and hunt. And that went on up until the 1990s when um, the Mill Lax Reservation, which was created under this treaty, uh, took this to court and actually uh, won those rights. So imagine they were battling for these rights that were guaranteed to them for over a hundred years. So the next treaty is the 1854 treaty. And in this case, again, uh, millions of acres were ceded. In this, in this case, um, as you can see on the image here, the red area is roughly equivalent to what was ceded. And a lot of minerals had been discovered there, specifically a, a, a heavy mine, a vein of copper. And so there was a very big interest. There was still a lot of timber to be had. And um, this is now, this area is now known as the Iron Range of Minnesota, which um, has been heavily exploited for mining over the years. Again, this treaty explicitly provided hunting, fishing, and harvesting rights on all of these ceded lands. So it was guaranteed that the people would continue to have the rights uh, to fish and harvest, particularly wild rice. And I'll get to that a little bit more in a moment. This treaty also created, established um, several reservations, the Grand Portage, and I am probably not saying this correctly, but the Poise Forte and the Fond du Lac reservations. And then we get to the 1855 treaty, which you can imagine came pretty quickly on um, the 1854 treaty. And I, I like this image. This uh, map is actually from Honor the Earth, which is involved in the line three um, actions. And here you can see what was um, seeded. And you can also see uh, several of the reservations. And in this image, I also show you where the current line three or the old line three pipeline is and the new one. But let's get back to the treaty. So in this treaty is the first time that they did not explicitly provide or grant those hunting, fishing and harvesting rights that they had in the previous treaties. They didn't say that they weren't provided those rights, but they just weren't really addressed. Uh, this treaty was kind of executed pretty quickly and it was just kind of ignored, which left it open to dispute later on. Um, this treaty also established the Leech Lake and Mill Lax reser reservations. And um, it was unique and this is particularly important in that it kind of refers back to, to the General Allotment Act that later came in the 1870s that Sarah mentioned. This was I think the first time that they decided that they wanted to interrupt the kind of collective culture of um, indigenous people. And so this was an attempt to do that by allotting lands for individual families. So this treaty did that, at least in Minnesota for the first time. The other thing that happened with this treaty is that um, there were always payments and um, annuities involved, but this particular treaty made this a bigger issue where the tribes were particularly dependent on the payments. And, um, and at the same time, I'm gonna talk about this now collectively, um, as the tribes were becoming dependent on these annuity payments, they were having less and less access to the lands um, because the lands were becoming degraded from the deforestation and the mining and just the uh, growth, population growth and colonization. So this map shows you all of the ceded lands in Minnesota over this roughly three decade period and then the reservations as they still stand. Um, so one of the things that was going on with the allotments, I mean, with the uh, payments, is that these annuities were, were wrought with corruption and it was made very difficult for the tribes to collect the payments. So they would do things like they would schedule the payments to happen in inclement weather. At one point they scheduled a payment at a point when the tribes were very distinctly moving to the reservation that had just been created. And the agents of the payments um, were able to keep the funds 
if uh, if the money wasn't collected. So there was all sorts of, again, just corruption going on. Um, so in the meanwhile, in regards to the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, while some of the treaties reaffirm the rights to hunt and fish and gather on ceded lands, um, the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources continue to just kind of obstruct that. So overall, through these treaties, 50 million acres of land were ceded, including 2 million acres of sacred waters. The lands were destroyed by mining and logging, which made the sustenance difficult at the very same time that the tribes were becoming more dependent on the annuities. And then of course, there were um, numerous reservations created. So in this image, um, you can see the three treaties I talked about, and I wanna draw your attention to the black line and the black area arrow, which shows where the original line three was built. It started in the upper left-hand corner and then um, came down across the page or the screen that you see there. And I wanna bring your attention to that black arrow because that yellow spot in the middle of the page is where the largest inland oil spill in US history occurred in 1991 when 1 1.7 million gallons of oil released into the Prairie River. And the only thing that prevented that becoming, that these are the headwaters of the Mississippi, by the way. The only, re, the only thing that prevented that from becoming a terrible catastrophe was that it was the middle of the winter and the water was frozen at the time. And so they were able to um, hold it and collect it and contain it. If you look at the yellow dot on the top side of the page, um, that was another oil spill that happened in 1973. And you don't actually hear much about this one. It's actually kind of hard to find information on it on the internet. But this resulted in a 1.3 million, million gallon spill and um, was actually much more difficult to contain because it happened in the summer. So these are just some examples of how you can see in relation to uh, the pipeline, you can start to see the pattern and the interrelationship between the pipeline itself and how um, the ceded lands and the reservations themselves are affected and impacted by the spills. And uh, this was not on the line three pipeline, but it's worth mentioning because it is another one of the pipelines in this area, it was line six. And this was the Kalamazoo River oil spill. This was about a million gallons of oil um, spilt into, again, what are headwaters for millions of people. This happened at a dam. OK, so then moving forward, this map shows you, and I want to draw your attention now to the new pipeline, which is really the focus of our discussion today. So the lower area arrow in red, uh, is kind of pointing you to the new pipeline currently under development and that Enbridge is hoping to finish very soon. They're working on it 24 hours a day. And the new pipeline presents some new troubles because as you can see, if you've been following this issue, White Earth Reservation um, and tribal members have been particularly active in this because this new pipeline is going to affect um, their areas of fishing, harvesting of wild rice um, significantly. All the area, areas that I show you in yellow there are areas that are significant to fishing and particularly wild, wild rice harvesting. Um, and you can also see in this map, again, the three treated areas that I've discussed. So you can see that this wild rice harvesting as well as the fisheries are uh, very vulnerable. They've already been vulnerable to and um, degraded by deforestation, development and already and mining and the previous line three pipeline. And now they're even more vulnerable because the new pipeline is gonna bring in twice as much tar sands oil and it's going to go through different areas that are sacred. This, this photo shows a member of the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe tribe harvesting rice on Mud, Mud Lake. And Mud Lake and Goose Lake are together the third largest wild rice harvest areas in the state of Minnesota. 
And uh, again, it's already been threatened and the new pipeline is gonna threaten it more. And in the words of Honor the Earth, all pipelines leak. The pipelines threaten the culture, way of life and physical survival of, of the Jibbaway people. Without it, we will die. It's just that simple. So in summary, since the tribe ceded their lands over 150 years ago, they fought for the rights provided in the treaties to harvest fish and hunt, the spiritual, cultural, and ceremonial needs that were guaranteed in the, in the treaties and with some of the law that Sarah's talked about um, have been held upheld in court rulings. They've been deliberately obstructed and now the new pipeline presents amplified threats as it crosses more waterways and brings more tar sands oil. And with that, I'd like to hand it off back to Alma and we're going to hear a little bit from the audience. Thank you so much, Elaine and Sarah. Um, so we were gonna do a fancy Zoom poll, but we're having trouble with our poll function. So I'm gonna do, go back to the old fashioned way. And if you wanna maybe put your um, screen view on gallery, you can see people. I'm just gonna ask for like an old fashioned show of hands. So, um, did you learn something new about the history of native people and treaty rights? Raise your hand if it's, yes. Cool, nice to see. All right, question two. Did you learn something new about line three? Nice. And then, um, it, have you attended a pipeline protest before, or do you know somebody who has intended, attended a pipeline protest before, including the one against line three? Great, so that's just to kind of give a sense to our speakers of kind of who we have in the audience. So thank you. And um, I'm gonna turn it back to Sarah now to talk about the whole gang is gonna talk about their experiences at the line three protest. So Sarah. Okay. So I'm going to share some pictures and um, then we're going to have uh, Carrie and Sydney are going to share some of their experiences as well, because we all had different experiences at line three. Um, and so this is just the beginning of the action. Uh, and we were there um, upon the invitation of Tara Hauska, who hosted the Treaty People Gathering. And that was from June 5th to June 8th. And there was a call put out for numerous organizations to come and support their efforts at line three. Um, but there were also rules that we had to abide by, by which um, I'm gonna let Carrie talk a little bit more about. The idea being is that we were following her, we were following the tribal people there, we were following their lead and we did what they wanted us to do. Um, and that's an important aspect of this is that we are the followers and they are the leaders. So one of the ways in which we came in which many of us came was through an organization called Arm in Arm. Um, and Arm in Arm is basically the, the beautiful brainchild of the US Climate Action Network. And it was, it was birthed by them. And as Arm in Arm's um, position is that it's time to ignite a transformational era that ends the climate crisis through sustained disruptive humanitarianism, centering racial and economic justice. And Arm in Arm basically went out and reached out to as many organizations as possible, to as many US CAN members as possible. We had buses coming from all across the country uh, to meet up in Minnesota and to take this action, um, which made it even more powerful because we got to know each other along the way and we got to know each other while we were there. And so we literally were beginning to form this arm in arm relationship and, um, and you can join arm in arm too, but we'll get there, okay? So we got there, we had this hotel, beautiful hotel on a lake, and then we had a training in the morning. And what we first learned was that there are three roles to these actions and the, it's true for other actions as well. You have the green rail role, which is if you don't wanna be arrested, chances are you will probably be leaving early. Um, in this case, uh, you, many of the green people distributed supplies. Uh, we actually had a bus that delivered us there. And so the bus was able to go pick up extra water, especially it was very hot um, and help out on the lines um, as well. But I, the idea being is that if, if it looks as though the cops are coming, if they're going to charge in, 
Uh, the greens do not want to be there. They do not want to be arrested. Then you have the yellows who are willing to submit to potential arrest, would probably rather not. But the yellows were the people that were, say, the marshals. And the marshals were the people, it was actually Elaine and myself, that were receiving information um, via uh, texts, secure texts, as to what was needed where on the site, because the actual action site was quite large. There was um, the pump area, the pump station area, which you'll see sort of some pictures of, um, and then a couple roads in and out. And so it was actually, I don't know, it took a few minutes, probably five to 10 minutes to walk actually back from the main road to the pump station. So it was a large action site. Um, so the, the yellows are also holding the line if the cops decide to try to make a run at those people that are trying to prevent um, construction. And that was the role. Our role was to prevent construction. Um, and then there are random duties as well. And then finally, you have the Reds. And the Reds are the people who have agreed in advance that they are willing to lock down or willing to link arm in arm to try to prevent police access to the pump station. These are the people that expect to get arrested. Okay, and those were the three roles that we had. All of them kind of vary and all of them had different, different things to do. Um, we had our stars show up, they came out. Um, Jane Fonda stopped by for a bit and, and rallied everybody. She actually came back to the pump station um, and spoke to those people that were locking down and those of us back there that were helping out. We had uh, Piper Chapman, who's the woman on the left of Winona LaDuke, who's on the right there. Um, for those of you who don't know Piper Chapman, she was the star of Orange is the New Black. Uh, but the idea here being that uh, that kind of attention, those people showing up, means that there's more attention being paid to us by the media um, and they bring it. So it's, it's important to have them there. So we started off by setting up the defense. And one thing that we didn't know and I didn't find out until just a few weeks ago was that, so this is the access to the pump station. And the pump station, there was actually a fence here at this access point. And what we did not know was that at four in the morning, um, the walls were scaled of the pump station and uh, the gates were open from the inside. And what you see here is not their gates, it was our gates that were built after the gates were already open to the people that would go down and lock down in the pump station area. And so this was built throughout the day. One of the beautiful things about uh, protesting a construction site is that there are so many wonderful materials to build things out of, and uh, they were used very well. Uh, Extinction Rebellion showed up very, very early in the morning. Normally, Extinction Rebellion shows up with a canoe or a kayak, but in this case, they showed up with a boat, and they blocked the main access road to the actual construction site, the pump station site, and eventually people would lock down inside the boat, lock down underneath the boat, and I don't even think this was removed until I think it was maybe two o'clock the next day that they finally got everyone out of this boat. So they did a great job of slowing things down. The main access road, as we arrived, people were starting to just grab loose wood, anything they could find to make it more difficult to drive down the main access road. And then things like wattle were taken and very creatively turned into a snake, not quite a black snake, it's a blue snake. Um, to stop line three. And so lots of roadblocks, lots of efforts to just build things and, and make it more difficult to access the site. So at about one o'clock in the afternoon, I think it was, that's when the Fed, um, Joe Biden's Fed, flew over. It was a Homeland Security helicopter, the same Homeland Security helicopter, apparently, that buzzed uh, George Floyd protests. Um, and according to Homeland Security, a helicopter from U.S. Customs and Border Protection was brought in today to issue a dispersal order to a large group of people in the area of Two Inlets Pump Station by Park Rapids, Minnesota. The idea was to provide the order in a manner that everyone would be able to hear, which is really, really funny because nobody could tell what the helicopter was trying to say to us, although you kind of do know what it was trying to say. And what it really was there for was to harass and make life miserable for the people that were back in the pump station. So as you can see here, you can see all the dust that's starting to collect where the helicopter was buzzing it. And this is just a short video. So the, the pump station is behind that fence. So everybody that was behind there was experiencing that kind of dust. And, and you can note that 
while they said they sent this there because they wanted to make sure everybody heard the order that they were giving, there's no order being given. All they did was buzz the area to stir up the dust to make life miserable. So after that helicopter showed up, though, the assumption was sort of made that, OK, we better start locking everyone down, make sure everyone's ready to go, because it's soon, pretty soon the cops are going to come in. And so at that point, uh, the Greens pretty much left early. Um, the marshals and others in the yellow started to link arms and started to bring more materials and supplies back to the people in the arrest area, the red area, the lockdown, and the arm and arm area. And the camp started to really buzz. The action started to really buzz. So the greens left, the yellows organized, and the reds locked down. So part of this action, of course, is to try to prevent the police from being able to come down that main road, which would have been difficult anyhow, because there's a boat right behind this, this line of people. Um, but at that same time, people started to lock down. And I'll give you an idea of what locking down really means. Um, Oh, I was also going to say, we, uh, we, at that point, people were wondering when they were going to come. They thought maybe it was possible that um, they were going to do this overnight, kind of like the old Occupy camp style, where they would raid the Occupy camps at 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. So people started bringing tents in. Um, but unfortunately, around 5 o'clock, the police came in through the back door. And it was such a large site, it was hard to prevent them from coming in and hard to prevent them from getting right into the actual uh, pump station site. Outside the pump station, a number of uh, protesters continued to chant, um, continued to, to try to not necessarily be obstructive, but to let cops know how they felt. Um, it's important here to note, too, that that cop and all those cops are paid by Enbridge. There is an actual um, uh, money set aside, millions set aside to pay the cops to protect the oil pipeline and to protect Enbridge. These are state cops. These are local cops working for a corporation. So if you wonder what lockdown looks like, it's really, really clever. <laughs> so this is a lockbox where it, within the lockbox, their arms are probably in a tube that has metal around it. To be honest, I don't even know everything that goes into the actual locking down, but it's very, very difficult and time consuming for the police to get people out. And as you can see, this is actually by the boat. And as we said, the boat actually didn't get moved until the next day. And um, actually, some of the people that were in the boat spent the night there. And some of the people, this was some, one of the people underneath the boat. And there was a torrential rainstorm that night. You can see here the lockdown, you actually have two people locked down underneath the grid of the tractor. Now imagine how difficult it's going to be for them to get them unlocked and get through those, those uh, pipes that they're holding hands through. So that also takes hours. And then you've got this amazing woman who's also locked down underneath a truck. Again, you can see how difficult it is to get out from underneath that, to get someone locked out from underneath that. But then also imagine she's probably there for at least about eight hours. Um, and so it's, it's a really difficult job that they're doing and, it, and, and they deserve our deep respect for what they're willing to do and how long they do it for. So we're gonna go to Carrie and we're gonna go to Sydney who are gonna tell their, their behind the scenes looks at everything. Um, just a reminder though, that this was not our action. We were invited, the indigenous lead and we follow. And you reach out first if you wanna go. And I'm just gonna give these three different uh, uh, URLs where you can go and find out more, but Elaine is going to repeat those. So don't worry about writing any of these down. And so now I am going to hand it over to Carrie and Sydney. Thanks, Sarah. That was fantastic. I'm kind of excited to do another one. Let's do this. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm going to speak about logistics behind the scenes. I'm going to start with, again, like that question of why were we successful at shutting down construction at line three for a day? It was because, as Sarah said, we followed Indigenous leadership. We were trained and because caring for the people on the land is an act of love. And so when it comes to logistics, as some of you that do logistics knows, um, what's going on behind the scenes is really complicated in detail. And at line three, I tell you, the logistics folks not only showed up with their talents to organize 
They did it from a space of love and nurturing. And for all that participated, felt that, I think, at every moment, felt well taken care of. You know, I was part of the supply run. I will speak again later about the um, jail support, but that's why it was successful. All of those things, training, indigenous leadership, and love, right, and showing up. And so what does that look like from, you know, logistics that could be like breaking down barriers for participation, trusting indigenous leadership, honoring the request, every single request. And then when you have suggestions, make sure that they sign off on it, right? We had an, inc an incident where we were proposing songs and we passed it through the indigenous leaders there on the ground. And some of them are turned away and that's okay, but it has to be really clear who is a leader here, who we need to get approval from, and what does that look like? And we also need to make sure, you know, like other simple things that um, some people are unaware of in spaces like this, you know, you can't take photos without asking people if it's okay. Again, a high level of trust in this space. Um, so yeah, so those are some of the kind of the behind the scenes, the big picture, but luckily we have uh, Sydney here too, who is the logistics expert has been on the ground now for a couple of these uh, light protest, pipeline protest. And I'm gonna hand the baton off to you and I'll take it up again to talk about jail support. Hey everybody, um, my name is Sydney Mosier and I work with Carrie Clayton at US Climate Action Network and um, Arm in Arm, which uh, Sarah talked about earlier and we'll talk about a little bit later as well. So um, I'm going to go into the nitty gritty about logistics. So these are going to be the best practices we have learned along the way. And we have learned so much along the way. Each action, we get better and better. And we always do um, like a, a evaluation afterwards. And it makes us better every time. And we really dig into what did we do well and what did we do that we need to work better on. Um, so that's super exciting. So logistics are actually very crucial in supporting frontline leadership. In order for us to show up for frontlines in the best and most respectful way, we really focus on logistics. Um, so we call it making the trains run on time. Um, and while many don't see logistical work going on in the forefront, it's very important to think, keep things organized, safe, and uh, so the trains run on time. So I'm gonna go over some of those logistical tools we use in order to show up in the right way. After each action, we debrief, like I said, um, and, and what we ask for each other, ourselves is what worked well and what didn't. So uh, firstly, I'm gonna talk about registration. Um, as soon as we know the dates and details of an action, we put up a registration page. Arm and Arm uses Eventbrite, so that is what we used on our most recent trip out to line three in June. Um, so depending on if organizers of the action would like the action to be more private or public, we will password protect or not password protect. Um, so that's also very important in working with indigenous frontline leadership is to make sure that we have uh, from them whether or not we need to be more secretive or not secretive, but to be more protective of, of, of the action. Um, so another tool we use in registering is having a registration fee. So this can be any amount, but we find that $25 creates buy-in from attendees and builds commitment for them to show up on the day of the action. Um, it also helps with some of the costs of logistics, such as charter buses that we've been taking to these actions. Um, of course, we do have a discount code and coupon codes for those that need or request it. Um, secondly, and very importantly, is for security reasons, we do vet those that register for our buses. This is very important because it's our duty as logistics organizers to ensure that we are not bringing any participants to these actions that could actually be harmful to frontline communities or to the movement. Um, to do this, we require training of folks that get on the bus. And I do have a section on training that I will talk a little bit about. Um, but another registration tool we use is COVID and health risk forms, um, as well as collecting COVID vaccine cards for folks coming onto the bus, um, as they have been in the past year, um, required for RMNR participants to have. Um, we cannot risk bringing any positive COVID cases to the front lines. Um, another thing we do, like Carrie said, is reducing barriers and making people comfortable. So asking folks if they have food allergies or preferences, asking folks if they have a preference to room by themselves with a, with someone or if they have a preferred gender that they would like to be rooming with, um, if they need a room that is ADA accessible, et cetera. So we really do make sure to get a lot of information in order to make our participants as comfortable and as taken care of as possible so that they can show up in the right way as well. Once registered, folks are ready to join us on our buses or caravans to our actions. Um, and we have found that large charter buses are fantastic to getting folks to the front line. So for line three, I was on the bus from DC. It was 28 hour bus ride and it was very long, um, but our logistics made it easy and it, it ran very smoothly. 
Um, another tip for taking large groups on buses, um, we do a lot of peer to peer bonding and trust building as it's important for you to trust and have a lot of trust with folks that are going to these actions um, for safety and for confidence, all of that. Um, so next I'm going to talk a little bit about training. So as mentioned above, um, I talked about how trainings are required to get on our arm and arm buses. So trainings are essential in organizing these large parties to get to the front lines because um, folks must do our trainings to come so that we properly vet them. We make sure that they are not gonna be causing harm. Um, folks that registered with us did um, our arm and arm intro training, which covers anti-racism and de-escalation training, as well as basic get to know each other trust building exercises. Um, other important trainings that we did require before going to line three were deconality trainings and know your rights legal trainings. Um, the know your rights or legal trainings are super important. Not only do they demystify the judicial system in which you're entering, but they prepare you for any case scenario on the ground. All right, I have a few more minutes. Um, next, I'm going to go over why it's important to have clear roles. Um, so providing attendee with clear roles is super helpful to your attendees and super important for on the ground logistics. Providing clear roles and definitions and responsibilities of each role will help make the day of action run very smoothly and it'll give people a ton of clarity and confidence. Um, in rare cases, the roles won't be defined until the day of the action or even hours before. Um, so due to the nature of the action, and that's also okay. And at that time, it's very important to just be flexible and to move into your role on the fly and be okay with the unknown, um, which I personally have a little bit of trouble doing, but once you know that, you know, Indigenous leadership is leading in a place like line three, you know exactly how to get into your role. Um, for those actions that do have roles, um, some important ones are identifying your police liaison early on. Um, who's gonna be doing legal support? Who's gonna be doing supply runs? Like Carrie mentioned, her and our bus driver did a ton of supply runs and brought a ton of water to a bunch of dehydrated, overheated, red and yellow members who were fighting line three. Um, also de-escalation folks and peacekeepers, medical folks, and assigning and understanding roles is just important to, sh to show up to action right. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about communications before I pass it back to Carrie. Um, communications is my favorite part, personally, of organizing logistics. It's my favorite way to communicate and get to know our folks that we have coming with us. Um, we have found that lots and lots of logistical emails puts attendees at ease and builds trust between staff and attendees. Um, it's the beginning of the relationship building with some folks who are new to coming onto your bus or new to your organization. Um, and so it also makes people feel comfortable and knowing that they're in good hands at the start, knowing that they're getting all of the information that we have possible straight into their hands so that they are comfortable and confident. Um, Another comms tool that we use is office hours a lot. So uh, for example, on, on our way to line three, Carrie and I both did office hours with folks we were organizing to bring on buses with us from, we had one bus from Seattle and then one from Washington DC. So answering questions and being there and saying like, we have three hours over the next week on these three days, come ask us any questions you have, whether they're logistical or not, whether you need to just be like put at peace of mind. Um, and it's a very good way to get to know people who have a ton of questions and to maybe quell some of those fears or anxieties about traveling so far to a frontline fight. Um, also, deciding which channel of the comms we are going to use is important. So we use Google listservs at arm in arm to communicate with the initial information and then closer to the day of, sometimes we'll decide to use something called Signal, um, which is an encrypted messaging app for safe messaging. And also folks might request that you do use this kind of... It, encrypted messaging app, um, which is super important in security culture and it protects our frontline brothers and sisters and those fighting. Um, recently at the Mountain Valley pipeline, we used walkie talkies because there was a lack of cell service. So always having a backup plan and those walkie talkies were super useful, especially because we had folks in three different roles using them. So like it really creates a, a, a very streamlined event and it makes things happen. Um, and so those are a few best practices that we have found. And again, we are always refining and getting better. Um, Carrie is going to talk a little bit about jail support, which is very important. Very important. Um, it looks like that. there we go. Can everybody hear me? Okay. So what's good to know there's stages right to jail support and in preparation for this, everybody that is on site, whatever color you are, green, yellow, red, you are gonna be prepared to be arrested. You are gonna know your rights 
you're going to know what it's going to be like as a person being arrested. Um, and in the case of line three, people that were gender non-conforming or women were had a little more difficult time than males, white males in, in that case, but they were prepared for that as much as they possibly could. They knew what to expect. Um, also, people knew who to reach. Um, a lot of those people reached out to me. So essentially what that means is a lot of people, everybody actually, uh, that showed up to line three had, most of them had my phone number written on their belly in a Sharpie. <laughs> so when they were arrested um, and they got their first call, they knew who to reach out to. And most of the people that came with arm in arm had a strong relationship with me. So they already knew who I was. So I was getting a call from a friend who had just been arrested. This is all very important, right? And by the time I have that call, I have my, I pull up all the information we have asked beforehand. Like, oh, let's say Sydney was arrested. I know that Sydney, you know, might have a need for medical. Um, concerns. Maybe she has um, pills that she takes for some kind of ailment every day. I know these things. And so once I get the call from Sydney, once I realize what jail she's at, once I know kind of the next steps of where she's at in the process, I can make sure after I hang up with Sydney, I can make sure that I can give a call to the people at the jail there and communicate Sydney's needs. Maybe she has special dietary needs. And so I can make sure that that's noted there and it, those hopefully those needs are being met. Um, before arresting too, there's another thing. Um, people are worried about their things, you know. So I get a big room. I collect everybody's luggage. Everybody knows me. They know where their stuff is. So that's another thing that it seems minor, but it's so important to not have to worry about where's my stuff you know, or how am I, and then another piece of that is like, how am I going to get home once I have my stuff, but I can go into that in just a little bit. Um, so once somebody gets arrested, they get put in the paddy wagon and they get put to a jail. In the case of line three, unfortunately, they put them, um, people in different jails. I think this was an issue of a couple things, um, might've been, the local law enforcement's ability, uh, capacity to handle that many people being arrested at once. Um, and a second part of that is they were, I'll just be frank, kind of being jerks, right? So if they could spread out the people being arrested, it makes it harder for people like me doing jail support to get all of the systems in place to make sure everybody is taken care of. But we nailed it. We were great. We got it all figured out. <laughs> And we had enough people covering it. Again, when you approach things from a space of nurturing and love, everybody um, after the debrief that was arrested felt those two things. They felt like we were covered. Um, so yeah, so we identify the, where people are. We make sure their needs are met. We make sure in a case of Minnesota, this is not the case in all jurisdictions and all places and all states. Um, we make sure that legal is there for them for their bail hearings if there is one. Um, I know in Mountain Valley Pipeline, it was a little different. So uh, we have a legal team behind us. And then we have people picking up people at different places to get them home. But we also have a bunch of people waiting at each jail. So when somebody comes out after being arrested, they might have, you know, their burrito that they requested <laughs> waiting for them. But they have a, grand, a bunch of people cheering them on and welcoming them. Because as Sarah said earlier, this is a big deal that they just went through. Um, in the case of Minnesota, people are in jail up to three days, um, again, I'm not, you know, part of its capacity. I think part of it was um, keeping people away from protesting again, you know, just kind of, and maybe this authority, you know, I don't know, you know, like we're going to teach you a lesson kind of thing. It really felt like that was coming from a lot of people that were in jail. Like they felt like they were treated um, as, you know, you shouldn't be doing this. This is the wrong thing. But anyway, we can go into all those details another day. Uh, so people are picked up from jail. Um, they come see me at that point. I know they're on their way or I've picked them up myself, uh, depending on the situation. And uh, again, they're still in good hands. They're still being nurtured. We make sure they have a room, a shower, a good meal and a ticket home, whatever that looks like, or a ride home. Um, in the case of Minnesota, because we were not prepared for such long jail times, um, some of us pulled in favors. Like I had a friend that I knew their father lived in the area and I made a call and they're like, hey, some people need to get to the airport. Can you help me out? I mean, so that's what a network does. That's what friendship does. And that's what it looks like for, for jail support. 
Um, after people are home, they were supported and still are being supported. They're still going through, some are still going through the process from lane three legal support. Um, that is all taken care of as well um, and paid for. So a lot of what we do with Arm and Arm is we fundraise, of course, and all of those funds for line three, most of those funds for line three went towards legal support, supplies, getting the charter buses. It all goes back out to, to where we showed up. So that's it. And I think I hand it back off to Elaine. And also keep in mind that we want to keep some time available for questions yeah. as well. Yeah, thank you. And I just want to say that um, like so many things in life, it's those people behind the scenes that are just the unsung heroes. And I think that both um, Sydney and Carrie um, can uh, accept some kudos for that. So thank you. Um, in respect to time, I have some more slides, but I'm going to actually just kind of talk through them so that we can get move on to some questions. Um, one thing I want to talk about, is I just want to wrap up about um, violation of rights, because I think what you might have seen us, Sarah and I talking about early on was this role of rights um, and certainly precedents and legal precedents and all of the things that have led us up to where we are today. And so I just wanna kind of wrap up by talking about what's happened here since our action. And so um, we've established that uh, the building of line three on land that is protected by tribal rights is a violation of the treaties. And um, that tribes and allies continue to fight for those treaty rights that were bestowed by the US government and have been upheld in numerous court cases, including Supreme Court violate, uh, decisions. So I think it's important for us all to, hold, to keep in mind. And then I wanna just walk through a couple of things that have happened since. So um, that action happened, I think it was June 7th, very specifically. I might be off by a day, things were a little bl blurry um, and we were pretty sleep deprived by the way. <laughs> but um, anyhow, following that event on June 28th, there was uh, an issue where um, Tara Hauska, who we've, I think we've touched upon previously, who was a real leader in all of this, her property that she owns legally was barricaded by the police, formally barricaded uh, they took a lawsuit to, um, uh, to a judge, and uh, on July 23rd, a judge issued a restraining order saying, no, you don't have any right to barricade their property. Um, and I could have gone more into this, but you can find out more about this very easily online. That was July 23rd. On July 29th, the police fired on protesters, including Tara. Uh, with rubber bullets and they used tear gas at the con a construction site where the protest was going on. Hauska and others were arrested. They were subjected to solitary confinement when they were arrested. Um, August 18th, uh, Hauska and um, Laura, ha Tara Hauska and Winona Leduc submitted a formal complaint to the UN Rapporteur on Human Rights. Uh, that their rights were violating, their indigenous rights were violated as well as their human rights. And then on August 23rd, just today, just an event that uh, came to my attention is that the first arrest in this event that happened on June 7th um, has now resulted in the acquittal of the first person. So there's gonna be more uh, uh, on this to come. And uh, we haven't even talked about the ongoing support that I think um, Arm and Arm and many others provide even as these legal proceedings are going on. And then finally, just in that time frame, since June 8th and um, August 5th, there have been 12 spills of drilling fluids, releasing 10,000 gallons of these drilling flu fluids on these sacred lands. And at least $2 million has paid, been paid out to local law enforcement by that fund that Sarah mentioned uh, that's been financed by Enbridge while the police gloat about how much fun they're having and how they love the overtime pay. So these funds also, by the way, um, fund those less than lethal, lethal weapons. I've used that in quotes. Uh, the rubber bullets and the tear gas has also been funded by that um, Enbridge financing. Um, and then in, in real final, I, can I share this slide while we go into Q&A? And this has just kind of has all the, um, 
kind of has all the links and uh, just want you all to be able to see this one last time. So things that you can do, uh, there's Honor the Earth, which we've mentioned. You can go to their website, support them. You can join Arm, arm in Arm in future direct actions. You can join the Line 3 action by um, going to Stop Line 3. And of course, bringing it all back around, you can get involved with the Climate Reality Bay Area. And there is a virtual training coming up um, October, a global virtual training on October 16th. And remember, Indigenous people lead and we follow. Reach out first. Okay, so uh, we have a couple questions that came in on the chat. Uh, one was, um, is there work underway in Canada to stop the flow at the source? Um, any policies of the work to end tar sands oil? It's okay if you're not sure. <laughs> I, I have heard of like some action, but I'm not entirely sure there's a lot of action going on um, from our friends to the north. <laughs> and that's actually something we should probably look into. <laughs> um, the only thing I would add to that is to say the, the source of this problem being the tar sands, oil fields, is really complicated. It's so deeply entrenched in economics and it's a very uh, relatively poor uh, province in Canada. And the tar sands oil are the only source of really uh, kind of helping lift people up out of poverty there. So it's a very complex situation, uh, but one that I would just say, like Sarah said, we need to do more <laughs> on this. Uh, I also wanted to point people to um, one of the resources we put in the chat, which is LN3, line three, um, film. And you can get information about it on the Stop Line 3 website, which is in there too. And you can find it on YouTube. But I found that it's a 38 minute film. It's actually gives really good background and context for Enbridge, why Line 3 is so important, but it might be their last gasp. And the second thing is that um, part of why they want to build this pipeline is so they can export fossil fuels because the demand in North America has gone down. So they're relying on exporting in order to be able to survive as a company. So that's very telling to where we are in the climate crisis. Um, another question that we got was about how this fits into climate work we're doing in the San Francisco Bay Area. I can, I can probably take the lead on that one. Um, so yeah, we... So there are, there are enough fossil fuel fights here to get involved with, especially if you look at Richmond and where all the refineries are, Venetia, Martinez, all of that. Um, but also being aware of the fact that the tribes, if, if you heard our land acknowledgement, you will note that most of those tribes um, are not mentioned as, a, they're not federally recognized and therefore they, and, and they don't have treaties. So they don't have something to rest back on. So they actually need more of our support, especially the Ohlone. The Ohlone are not recognized. And so they don't have those treaties and they don't have the rights. Um, and then I think it's impossible, important to recognize indigenous roles and stewardship um, and recognize the Bay Area sacred spaces like shell mounds and spaces that we need to learn more about and learn more about the tribes in the Bay Area and how we can support their efforts because they are making efforts to, um, to gain their land back, to gain their rights back and so on. So it's a learn more opportunity as well. Oh, thank you, thank you, Sarah, Elaine, Carrie, Sydney for taking the time to um, educate us about the Stop Line 3 campaign. Uh, there are four links that we put in the chat. Um, the first one is actually a link to the film that I mentioned, the LN3 Stop Line 3 film. If you want more background, it's great because it actually puts it in context, um, including the context of like what Enbridge is trying to do in terms of surviving as a company and how um, the fossil fuels that are being extracted are actually mostly not to be used in the United States. Um, the second 
link is actually about the Bihalia pipeline, which is a pipeline effort that Climate Reality Project was part of, and Vice President Al Gore, who is one of the founders of Climate Reality Project, was very much a part of in his home state of Tennessee. And that was a pipeline that was proposed to go through um, a historic Black community. So, um, and a lot of these pipeline projects, like as we know with other fossil fuel campaigns are through historically disenfranchised communities. Um, and they actually mentioned the Mountain Valley Pipeline of the speakers, which is in West Virginia, which is actually a white community in the um, Appalachians or Appalachians. Um, the third link that's in there is actually our Climate Reality Project Global Training. Um, one of the main things Climate Reality Project does is trains climate leaders from around the world. Um, this is going to be October 16th to 24th. If you are a member and haven't gone to a training or if you wanted to learn more about connecting to Climate Reality Project, it is an excellent training. They do a great job at thinking about frontline communities and disenfranchised communities around the world. This will also be a chance to meet people from other parts of the world. And the last thing on there is actually a link to our local Bay Area chapter website, the action team page, because if you want to get involved on our action teams, we have several um, business engagement and policy action. And uh, as I mentioned, I'm the co-chair of our climate justice team. Our climate justice team meets the first Thursday of every month. All that information is on the website. And if you go to that link, um, it'll get you an email to me so that we can put you on the list. But we're meeting next week. And we have two events that are currently scheduled in September, three events. We have um, a boot camp for making presentations, climate reality presentations. And um, we have a speaker event that same day. And the next week we have our Indigenous Voices Listening Circle, where we read and watch films related to Indigenous campaigns that are related to the climate crisis. Um, and we talk about it as a group. So um, thank you for joining us. Thank you speakers for taking the time. Um, please do what you can to support the effort to stop line three. There are many ways you can do it. You could go to um, the Arm in Arm website. You can contribute to the campaigns, visit the stop line three website. And Sydney has put something in the chat with additional information about how to support the Stop Line 3 effort. Uh, learn about it, spread the word. This program is gonna be available on our YouTube live channel. So look out for it in the next few days.